Hello everyone and welcome to today's Microsoft Reactor session. I would like to welcome you from wherever you're joining us from the, in the world. Today we have Cory Stegorat Pace um, tuning in from Stockholm and then Carlotta Castelluccio <laughs> straight from Rome. Um, today's session is going to be um, about get, is going to be about getting started with databases, but I will let Cory to do the introduction for that session. Um, during the during the session, we would like to ask you to keep the chat alive, ask your questions, and our speakers will make sure to answer any any of your questions. But yeah, thank you for that. And with that, I will hand the word over to you, Corey. Um... Thank you, Erica, and uh, yeah, welcome to getting started with databases, SQL, and data visualization basics. Uh, as Erica mentioned, I'm calling from uh, Sweden, and I'm joined by my lovely colleague, Carlota, all the way from Italy. Carlota, how are you doing? Hey, hi, Corey. Hi, everyone. I'm doing well, very well. Uh, I'm happy to joining you today for this session, and thanks for inviting me. Great, great. And yeah, let us know in the chat where you're calling from. This is the typical radio beginning of, uh, let me know where everyone's calling from. So. We'll get really into it. Today's uh, chat, we're going to have a lot of fun, but we want to also make sure you get something from the session. So we have some clear learning goals here. Uh, one is to understand just the use cases of SQL, like where would you use this sort of database uh, and how to use it. And then secondly, around creating and querying a database. So that's all about uh, finding information that lives in the, a SQL database and using that for whatever use cases or projects that you might be working on. And then lastly, uh, you know, working with databases is fun. We get the data that we need, but maybe in certain use cases, we also want to see the data visually. Maybe we get better insights on that. So not only are we going to connect or query a, a SQL database, but we're going to use the data that we get back and actually build data uh, visualizations on that. And we're going to do that by talking about some of my favorite things, which is wine uh, and chocolate. Uh, I know maybe you're joining our session today and you thought this was going to be purely a technical talk, uh, but we actually are going to uh, take this a little bit further and I'll talk specifically around how uh, wine and chocolate could be relevant to uh, working with data and SQL. And we're going to do that by addressing a business problem. Um, so most of the time uh, when we're talking about working with data, it's about understanding or getting information from that data so we can uh, solve uh, a business problem or an issue that we are uh, facing, uh, whether it's to use the data to make you know, better sales or better insights on how the, the business is performing. And we've got a, a little business, Carlota and I. We have the Carlota Chocolate and Wines, uh, which is a Swedish and Italian wine and chocolate company. Obviously, the, uh, the chocolate is coming from Sweden and the wines from Italy because we actually want to sell things. I don't know how well Swedish wines would go. But we would like to start selling and packaging these things. We, so we want to know uh, which pairs of wine and chocolate will perform the best. Uh, so, but the question becomes, you know, what actually makes a good pairing? Uh, you know, we can kind of sort of think about what good pairings look like, but could it be something like similar taste? So sweet wines and sweet chocolates go together. So we'll make sure to uh, combo those things. Or maybe opposite tastes like sweet and salty. Uh, you know, if you're a big fan of Hawaiian pizza, like let us know in the chat, any fans of Hawaiian pizza, but this is the idea, right? Taking something sweet and salty and uh, putting it together. Maybe that's how we want to package our wines. And then maybe even also, uh, maybe wines from the same, wine chocolates from the same country go well together. So we take French wines and French chocolates, and that's how we sell, sell those things. Uh, but we will find the answers through data. Uh, you know, it would be fun for us to uh, look at all of the combinations of wines and chocolates and maybe doing a taste testing all about that, probably not the most healthiest choice. So in the more efficient way to do that is just answering this through data. And that's where our two tools in our toolbox come into play and what we're talking about today, uh, which is SQL uh, and data visualizations. So let's focus on SQL for the first. So what is SQL as it stands for structured query language? But it's actually uh, a little bit of a misname because uh, there's actually four languages built into SQL. So first is the data control language, which we won't be focusing on too much in today's session, but this is around controlling access to a database. As you can imagine, if you've probably seen the news, 
data leaks happen. Uh, and you really want to make sure that if you have sensitive information in your database or important information, that access and control of that or who can um, find that information uh, is you know, tight. So this is where the data control language comes in place. Uh, but then we also have data definition language. So this is when we want to create or modify tables. And tables for SQL, which we'll explain later, is actually where the data actually lives in. So that usually is around making things like a create statement, uh, which I'll show you later as well. Then we also have uh, the data manipulation language, uh, DML. So this is actually around creating or actually uh, changing the data. Uh, so again, now we have these tables and we want to insert data into where the data needs to live at. Uh, so we use a thing called an insert statement and that's where this uh, statement lives at. And then lastly, after we have all that data into the database, how do we find what's going on in, with that data? And that's when we use the last kind of sub language of uh, SQL, which is uh, the data query language or DQL. And this is when we use finding information and uh, using things like select statements, which we'll use quite often in today's session. Uh, but SQL, as a, in a nutshell, is the language of relational database management systems or RDBMS. Uh, and a relational database system, as I kind of alluded to, works with things uh, like tables and it has rows and columns where they all have some sort of interconnectedness or relation to one another as far as the data. Uh, so <clears throat> you can believe, you can think of that as SQL kind of expanding out uh, not only into maybe specific uh, versions, but how the data lives within the database is how kind of SQL defines uh, relational databases. There's actually several implementations of SQL. And when I started learning SQL, I was super nervous. I was like, what version of SQL should I learn? I want to make sure I learn the right version of SQL because there's things like MySQL, there's Microsoft SQL Server, uh, there's Postgres. And these are all implementations of SQL. So there's maybe slight differences in, in terms of the ways of querying a database, but the foundations of uh, SQL for most statements, and the, especially the ones that we will show today in today's session, or will work across the board. And as I was looking up different SQL implementations, I came across this cockroach DB, which I have never heard of, but I really like it because I, I call SQL like the, the cockroach of all technologies, which I mean that in the best way possible because SQL was invented around 1964, which for a technology language or any sort of technology is ancient, but we are still talking about SQL today. And why is that? Well, if I looked at, uh, go to LinkedIn and I look for jobs that we have SQL listed as a skill, I look, I have seen that now there's 2,427 jobs uh, where SQL is either a required skill or a nice to have, or is the skills that we, you will utilize in your day-to-day -day work. So I like to say that SQL is a, a life skill. Like if you work in today in any sort of te technical capacity or working with data, SQL will be useful for you. And for a country like Sweden to have that many uh, jobs, and again, Sweden's population is around 10 million. Like, I don't know, maybe this is I, quick math, maybe like one in four people need to know SQL uh, that are working in the professional world. This is uh, super important. And of course, the jobs that uh, come up are you know, the usual suspects like data scientists, data analysts, data engineers, anyone working with day-to-day -day, uh, day -day with data. But also some other jobs that you might not think would use SQL also have those things listed like uh, product managers, where maybe you want to query a database to understand the performance of a certain feature that guides you on the direction of where you want to take the product and the product roadmap. Even sales operations, uh, uh, sales operators use SQL and maybe just to understand, again, sales performance or what sort of customers or clients uh, they should be targeting in the next quarter and even customer success. So people who work and fix uh, problems of customers under the products, maybe also finding both the answers to the, the, the issues that they're working with, or just the common uh, problems that come about so they can build maybe documentation or knowledge center articles around that. So SQL is used pretty much almost universal when you look at some of these sort of skill sets uh, that uh, actually use this day to day. So again, I like to say it's a life skill. So happy to have you here to learn a life skill. But the next thing we want to do when we want to start working with any data is actually understanding it. And there's ways to kind of look at the data before you even do anything around a database or making queries or anything like that. So let's start looking at our database or our data that we're going to use in today's session. So when we have this chocolate review table, 
Uh, so if I look at it now, you know, there's a reference uh, column, which might be useful for us when we're looking to actually maybe ship these products, these chocolate, and maybe these are where we reference to pull them from the warehouse. But we also have other relevant uh, columns like the manufacturer, so who makes the chocolate, where the, that company is located, uh, the bean location. So chocolates all have uh, beans that are made from them. So that might be important when we're talking about pairings, as well as the taste of the chocolate, which is super important because, again, we might want to pair these chocolates uh, on wines based on taste. So lovely that we have that already in the database and the rating. So how does this taste or how good is this chocolate? And I, if you look at the taste column, which I already see, which is exciting to me as a you know data person that I see like very much similar types of descriptions of taste that you might describe wines. Like we even have, if you see here, a red wine tasting chocolate. So that sounds perfect when I'm looking to solve the problem around how do I pair these chocolates and wines? Maybe red wine will be the, the best one. Then we look at the wine reviews. So we have some similar uh, and common columns or com common data points. So the name of the uh, name of the wine, uh, the region, so where that wine is made, which again, when we're talking about pairings, maybe this could be uh, an idea of where we pair the regions and the company locations, a rating. So that's great. We get already a taste. So we don't need to try every wine out here uh, to understand how uh, good it is. And also the notes of the wine, which relates to the taste. So I can see already that we have some data points that we can use uh, in this these tables uh, where we can make and solve our business problem of finding the best pairings. So let's actually get start querying. Let's start building and working with SQL. And before we actually do that, a little pro tip for me is that we should sort of write these queries or write these statements of when we want the date, how we want the data by hand first. And I know that sounds weird and I'm not trying to be some like, everyone should write code by hand before we get started uh, actually writing on the computer and no, don't use any smart tools. What I mean by that is that writing queries by hand is super helpful to kind of understand, especially when you're starting out, uh, specifically what data that you want and how to actually get that. So writing a query is a good start, good starting point um, to understand again, instead of doing like a trial and error of which query and what data should I, would I expect to get back. Um, so once we uh, start working with SQL, the first thing we need to do is actually create a table. And that's where we define the and work with the SQL data types. So if I look at the um, common SQL data types and how they relate to the data that we are using, uh, I can see that we have uh, the integer or int uh, data type, and that's used primarily for whole numbers. And if you look at our data, we see that the reference on, uh, and the chocolate is a whole number, so there's no decimal points. And we also have decimal points, so a decimal data type in SQL, uh, which is for exact numbers. Uh, and for those, the ratings seem to be very much tied to that, whether they're uh, 90.1 or you know, 3.5. Um, so that's where we will use decimal as a data type. And then var char, which is short for variable character. Uh, which is primarily used for strings, but this can contain uh, letters and numbers. And it's a great data type for um, the data that we have around the country, the notes, uh, the taste, uh, even the company the location. Now, these are not all of the data types that are available in SQL. And again, even when we look at specific implementations of SQL, there are other unique data types. Uh, but there are some honorable mentions that it won't be relevant for us in this session, uh, including the date. So maybe... Uh, if we're talking about wines, like when the wine was made, oh, it could be super important. Uh, the timestamps and even blob like a, that's used for images uh, and files uh, that could be also um, stored in your database or be referenced. So the first thing we want to do is when we set up the database is create the table. Uh, and this is actually nicely named uh, a create using a create statement. So what you see here is that I'm creating a table called wine ratings. I'm taking the name, uh, so the name column. I'm using var char, which is, again, the variable character. And I'm also setting this uh, number to 30. And what this 30 represents is actually kind of the length of, or the expected length, uh, a limit length of that uh, string. Uh, in, this, in this case, I'm just, I know what the data sort of looks like, and 30 seems to be a common number. Um, but, you know, depending on your data, this number could be 300, it could be 10, it could be five. Again, it should just sort of relate to the data that you're working with. Um, we also have region, which we use a bar char for. 
And then rating, which, uh, like I mentioned earlier, decimal seems to be the most relevant to that because it is a decimal number. And then I had this three one. And what that shows is that the, I expect three digits uh, and then one digit to be at the end or after the decimal point. So when we see the ratings for the wine, it's like 90.5, uh, 92.6. So this one represents the 0.6. And then lastly is the notes. So these were the, the big long text uh, where we had uh, all of the different tastes and the, the notes of the wine. Uh, so I use that to var chart and I set that to 300 for now. After we created the table, now we need to fill that table, right? That's the super important part of finding the data later on. So we use an insert into, so into the table that we just created, and then we select the, val the values that we want to insert into that table. And what you'll notice is that these, the list or the order of uh, this data, so the two up Shiraz 2005 from Australia with a 90 rating and this vibrant Chrisman wine display of rich, dark berry fruits, the notes uh, beautifully written, all connect to how that will fit into the table. So it's super important to have the correct order when you're inserting uh, these values in there uh, because then they relate to the columns. So again, working with rows and columns in a relational database side of things. So now that we have the data, we can start answering some of the questions that might be relevant to finding the pairings. Uh, so maybe the first question we'll ask is what are the best wines, right? Maybe it's just as easy as just finding the best chocolates and the best wines and putting them together. So how will we do that? So the first thing we'll do is use a select statement. Uh, and a select statement, uh, again, is the querying or starting to find the data with, that's within the database. So we will select the uh, columns that we are interested in. In this case, it's all of the columns. So the name, region, rating, and notes, and from wine ratings. Now, this, if I were to run it, would give me all of the wines. And that's not really what I'm interested in, right? I said I wanted the best wines. So instead, now we will take the, uh, re the column, the rating, which is where we would find what the best wines are, and we're going to order those, that result by the rating. And we will descend with DESC uh, just to have it in order that makes the most sense. But that will also give me all the rinds. And maybe that's, again, a lot of data. We don't really have a bet, an idea here of how much is in there. So another nice statement that SQL uh, provides us is a limit statement. So now using this, I can get the top five uh, wines, uh, which makes my life much easier when I'm talking about pairing wine, best wines and best chocolates. Uh, so again, this is the full statement I'm selecting. Uh, for, uh, these columns from the table we just created, wine ratings, I'm ordering it by the ratings, and then I'm limiting it to the top five. The next question that we might want to ask is, what are the chocolates from Italy? Um, you know, maybe again, we want to do a regional play where we tie the Italian wines with Italian chocolates or maybe even somewhere else. So I just need to find out where chocolates from Italy, uh, how many we have and what they are. So the first thing we'll do is to use our common friend again, select statement to select the columns that we're interested in here from the uh, chocolate ratings table this time. And now that will give me all of the chocolates that are in the table, but I want again, specifically uh, ones that are from Italy. So I use this thing called a where statement and a where statement helps to define what that value in that column is. So in this case, we're going to use the company location and we will equal equal to Italy. So making sure that we get just the wines that are or the, the chocolates that are from Italy. It makes our, again, our life easier because now we can easily find the data uh, that it's connected to, or either find the, the chocolates that are from Italy. Now let's get a little spicy, right? Let's get a little deeper into our querying. Like we want to find all the spicy wines. So how would we do that? Again, it's our common, a good old friend select statement. We've gotten all the, the wines and we run this like we did last time. This will give us everything, which we don't want. We want to use uh, the like statement instead. So we do the select statement, the from statement from the table, and we also say where notes, which is where we would have the taste data, uh, is like spicy. So the like statement is finding uh, basically where or similar ways where that value is in that column. So it doesn't have to be in, like a where statement where it only equals spicy, right? Because we know the notes is a big, long text, so it wouldn't just say spicy. It wouldn't be just one uh, one value there. So we want to use the like statement in, instead. 
But this would be sort of confusing because, as I mentioned, it's a big long text. So it, you know, spicy could be at the end of the text. It could be in the uh, beginning of the text for notes. It could be in the middle. So how do we find spicy anywhere? Well, we will do that using wildcards. So these are these little percentage signs that I've now added to spicy. What this is saying to the database is find me spicy basically wherever. I could use this in a different way where maybe I could find spicy uh, only if it's uh, at the beginning. So I can use a percentage size on one side or maybe at the end, uh, whether it's a, if I use it at the beginning of that uh, spicy. But in this case, since I'm using two percentage signs, this is going to find spicy anywhere in the description of the notes. So super useful when you're looking for uh, this type of data or these type of values where they could be kind of anywhere within uh, the columns. And now to the final boss, right? Uh, how do we find good wine and chocolate pairings? So can similarly, we're going to use now the idea of maybe we'll take spicy chocolates and spicy wines. So we're going to first do a select statement, but things are going to get a little crazy because now we need to get both the chocolate ratings and the wine ratings together. Uh, so first we'll do a select statement. Now this is the longer select statement that we have. And you'll notice a, a new thing that all right, I've added into this query, which is an AS or AS statement. And what that is doing is allowing us to define in, in certain cases where we wanna make sure that we know what table uh, this column is coming from. Uh, or this value is coming from. So I have, for example, uh, chocolate uh, ratings or underscore ratings as uh, chocolate rating. So because there's also a wine rating and I want to make sure that I know exactly that this is a chocolate rating and this is the wine rating and not get those too confused. And I would have just two columns of rating and not know exactly where that would take place. So this makes it more specific to the request. And then also the results that we will see later on uh, will give those um, better clarity around that. Then, and then we'll take this from the chocolate ratings and the wine ratings. But this, again, if this actually were to run, um, this would just give us two results and we'd have to look at two different tables and that's kind of annoying. And uh, you know, we might as well just run two different queries and have two screens and it'd be super confusing. So we luckily, uh, SQL gives us another statement called the join statement. And this allows us to actually join uh, the results of the query. Uh, so that we can easily see and compare those things. There's multiple different join statements. There's auto joins and um, even different implementations have other or like right and left joins. In this case, we're using an inner join. Uh, and you'll see from the last statement of this uh, query, I have an inner join uh, from wine ratings. So taking that uh, wine ratings that the column from on the company location of wine ratings and re joining that with the region uh, from the chocolate as well. So then we have one table that has all of those uh, values, but it's going to be joined on that one um, column, which is nice. It cleans up a lot of our, our work. But now we're looking for the good pairing. So we need to also then use our, uh, from the last examples, uh, our where statements, where we could find the most characteristics, which is a um, from the wine table uh, or from the chocolate table as far as the taste and also the notes from the wine table. So we use like for both of these things and an and statement uh, to combine them. So now we can have results around finding spicy wines and spicy chocolates, uh, which is exactly what we want uh, for finding good pairings around taste. But that's super fun. And you know we will get, uh, we'll see later these results of these queries, there are rows and columns, but sometimes being visual around data also gives us great insights. So I'll pass it to Carlota to talk about data visualization. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Thank you so much for this awesome introduction. Um, so uh, as you as you said, um, uh, SQL is a great mean to explore our data and the queries you, sh you just showed are simple but very effective. Um, but now when we talk about data exploration, there's another powerful tool that data scientists and data analysts should, uh, can and should use to better understand the data. And this, uh, this is data visualization. This includes looking at raw data, viewing summary measures such as averages, or graphing, graphing the data. 
So in particular, graphs are a powerful means of viewing data because they can help you to discern moderately complex patterns quickly uh, without needing to define mathematical summary measures. Uh, and in general, images, so also graphs, speak for thousands of words. Uh, and as well explained by these popular infographics designed by Hot Butter Studio, raw data contain potential meaningful information and insights that can be extracted and become clear to humans only when the data are processed, sorted and arranged, for example, by removing noise and aggregating by similar features, and finally presented visually. A more recent version of this infographic, which gone viral on social media, as you might have seen it on LinkedIn, uh, added a fifth step to this pipeline as data storytelling, which means adding a narrative context to numbers, telling an effective and engaging story from data. Uh, and I truly believe that exploratory data analysis and data visualization, as we are doing today with our project, are important tools which can support achieving this result. So before going into um, the details of uh, data visualization and digging into some uh, some code, I'd like to give you a little bit of talk context of the technologies we are going to use. Um, R and the Tideverse framework is my favorite option when I need to choose how to explore and visualize my data. Uh, so Tideverse is a collection of our packages designed to make data science faster and easier. Um, it includes, for example, you may have heard about ggplot2, dpr, tidyr, um, but saying that Tideverse is only a collection of packages may result too simplistic. Uh, so let me add that Tideverse is more a philosophy embodied by a set of packages sharing the same principle and also the ambitious mission of facilitating the conversation about data between humans and computers and also to speed up your learning curve when dealing with data transformation and visualization. But probably you're wondering here, uh, wait a minute, we're talking about SQL, so how we can um, uh, integrate the skills we just gained on SQL with R? And this is easy to explain. Uh, you can rely on SQLite, which is an open source, lightweight, run anywhere uh, database management si system. SQLite has wrapper libraries, both for for Python and R, and in case of R, this wrapper library is called RSQLite, and it provides full SQL implementation, so you can run every statement that Corey just showed us, uh, and many more operations. It provides a local performance database to store data, but also to clean and transform data for analysis. Um, so before showing how we, we are going to help Corlotto chocolates and wines with a market investigation, let me briefly cover how we can work with SQL and R in, in the same project. So first thing first, we are going to create our database and we're going to load our tables. So we, um, or, or better we, in the Tideverse, we call it tables. Um, and our tables collect chocolate and wines reviews and ratings. So we add these tables to our DB. Then in order to access and query this data with SQL statements, uh, as I mentioned previously, we are going to use our SQLite, uh, the R SQLite library, and also the DBI library, uh, which stands for database interface. And on top of that, we have our R program or our notebook, which making use of the Tideverse framework allows us to apply more complex transformation of the data and to visualize it with, with graphs. Um, so, great. Um, we talked a lot. Let's go uh, to, uh, to, to, to see and run some code. Um, here we are, so you can see my screen. Perfect. Um, so once again, let's imagine our, let's recall our use case scenario. So we work for a, a Swedish, Italian wine and chocolate company that would like to start selling wine and chocolate packages. But before launching the products on the market, they ask us to analyze competitors' data to build a report. So, well, let's start with importing into the environment the libraries we need for our demo. Uh, we already uh, saw it before. Um, they are DBI, RSQLite, and Tidyverse. 
And here we don't need to install anything since this Jupyter notebook is currently running on GitHub code spaces. Um, and it uses a customized dev container image, which embeds all the packages we need to run this code. And we will provide you with the, um, the, the link to this repo so you will be able to uh, use also this, um, this customized dev container image uh, to uh, replicate this, uh, this de demo on your own. So now, first thing first, what we need to do, uh, we said it in the beginning, we need to create our SQL IDB. Um, and we do that by using the DB connect function um, and by passing as parameter this empty string. Uh, this empty string um, specifies that we are creating a temporary DB, which will be automatically deleted when we disconnect from it. Uh, then we can load our uh, raw data from public sysbu files and store it as to our tables. So one is storing all the wine reviews in the wine ratings table, and the other one is storing all the chocolates reviews. Um, and lastly, let's copy um, with the function db write table, let's copy these tables um, into our SQLite database. Uh, in this way, and, and with DB, DB list tables, we can um, list all the tables we have just added to the, to the database, which are chocolate ratings and one ratings in our case. So with this simple line of code, we are now ready to perform SQL queries on our data. So let's start, for example, to, um, with, with, the sim with the simple query. Uh, we want to... Um, look at the first five rows of the chocolate ratings dataset. So in SQL, to do that, we can rely on the um, select all statement. So we saw in the DAX that select is used to, um, to select um, some columns from the, data, from the database. In this case, we are going to select all the columns from chocolate ratings, and we are using the limit statement because we want to print only the first five rows. So this is the result. We have the first five rows here of our um, uh, chocolate um, uh, ratings table. Uh, I will not go into the details of, of, of this data because Corey already um, uh, did it for us. Uh, so we know the data, right? Um, so what I want to, uh, to show you now is how you can... Um, how we can spot missing values in R. Uh, in fact, one of the main issues when dealing with real world data is missing data. And missing data in a data set are specified as NA, not available. So to spot missing data in R for each column, we can use this function, is.na function. Um, and then we use the call sums function because we want to count the number of NA for each column of the, of the table. So for chocolate ratings, we can see from the result that the only column which has uh, NA value is the ingredients column. Since we are not interested in going into the details of the ingredients in our analysis, we'll just remove that column together with other features we are not going to use in our analysis. And we can do that by, again, with a SQL query and again using the select statement. But this time we're not selecting all the column. We are just selecting the ones uh, we want to use for our analysis, which are the ones Corey um, uh, explained us and showed us. Uh, so let's see the result. Um, the result is this one. We have the, the reference column, we have the company manufacturer, the company location, the country of being origin, the most memorable characteristics, which are what we called pre previously tasties, and the rating uh, in a scale from zero to five. Great. So this is our um, chocolate table. So the, the chocolate ratings table we are going to use um, in our analysis. And similarly, we can proceed for the wine ratings. So first, let's have a look to the, five, to the first five uh, rows, uh, again by using the select all statement and the limit five to print only the first five rows. And this is re the result. Um, also, this table of wine ratings, you know it, so I'm not going into the details of, of each and every column. 
Uh, but again, what I want to show you is that we can spot not available or missing values in this data set by using the is.na function. And here is the result. Um, so we have lots of missing values in the grape column here, a few hundreds for the variety column, um, and only three for the region column. Uh, also, for the notes column, we have a few an A, but we cannot really consider these as missing values since usually reviews have an optional open field from notes. So, um, given that we are going to exclude grape and variety column, which has which have lots of an A values from the data set, um, and we are going to select only the columns we are going to use for our analysis again um, with. Um, by, uh, we, by writing a SQL query and by uh, using the dbget query function to, to run the query. So here we are selecting the column um, we want to use for our analysis for the wine ratings DB, uh, sorry, for the wine ratings table. So we have the name of the wine, the region of the wine, the rating, at this time on the scale of zero, of zero from zero to to 100 and um, and some notes which contain some details about the taste of these of these wines. Great. So now that we know our data and we also know how to perform some um, some queries. Um, sorry, here we are. So uh, now that we know our data and we know how to perform some SQL queries on our data um, with R, uh, we can start with our exploratory data analysis. And I will um, I will use similar questions to what Corey um, used in um, uh, during his explanation of of SQL queries. So we will start by asking what are the best wines. So we are starting to explore uh, which are the wines which has um, which have um, the best ratings. So for sake of simplicity, we have previously assumed that we had only one rating for each one item in our data set. But unfortunately, and this is dealing with reality, this is not true in our data set. So we can have more than one rating for the same uh, wine item. So we are going to complicate a little bit our SQL query um, to extract the five top rated wines. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, as you said, so we are going to use again the order by the order by statement that Corey used in his query, uh, and we are ordering by um, descending a descending order of rating. We are also using again the limit statement here to have the five top rate rated uh, wines. Uh, but the difference is that here we are adding an average on the rating and a group by name because we want to have from each wine, only wine rating that corresponds to uh, the average of all the ratings for that one item. So we can rely to do this on the average function and the group by statement to average the rating for all the wines with the same name. Um, and this is the result. So th these are the five top rated wines, uh, and these are all the characteristics of the five top rating, rated wines. Um, so good job for now, but we say that we want to visualize our data, right, uh, in order to better understand it, understanding it. So let's start with a very simple graph to visualize some quantities and in particular the scores of the five top rated uh, wines, uh, the ones we have extracted so far. So as mentioned at the beginning of the demo, we are going to use the Tidyverse framework for performing data visualization. And in particular, one common package to create elegant graphs in R is called ggplot2. And it provides an intuitive way to create a graph by combining independent components of a graphic in a series of iterative uh, steps. So let's start to see how we initialize a graph in, um, uh, in ggplot2. We initialize a graph in ggplot2 by using this function, ggplot, and by specifying the name of the tables um, we, want to, we want to plot. 
Uh, in the tidyverse, we use the pipe operator uh, specified by this uh, symbol here to perform operations in logical sequence by passing an object forward into a function or a call expression. And you can think of the pipe operator as saying, and then in your code. So ggplot here creates an empty, um, an empty graph to which you can add layers by using a plus operator um, and a specific geom function. In particular, to visualize quantities, we can use um, a bar chart, a bar chart type of plot. Um, and we can do these by using, in ggplot2, by using geom call function. Uh, which adds a layer of bars whose height corresponds to the variables that are specifying by the mapping argument. And the mapping argument is always paired with uh, the AS parameter, the aesthetic parameter, which specifies how variables in the data are mapped. And what goes into AS are variables found in the data. And in this case, we specify that we want to map on the X axis, the Y name, and on the Y axis, the, the rating, the Y rating. Um, and uh, while the other layers added to this graph customize the non-data components of our plot, uh, like adding the title, wine ratings, adding the labels to the X and Y uh, and Y axis. And in addition to that, ggplot2, um, the so-called theming system of ggplot2, enables further customization uh, of non-data element of your plot through three main components. You have the elements which specify the non-data elements that you can control. Here you can see uh, the plot title element, the banner grid element, the axis text element. So these are all elements um, and they can be roughly grouped into five categories. We have the plot category, the axis, the legend, the panel and the facet. And each element is associated with an element function, which describes the visual properties of the element, like element text here, um, which draws labels and headings, uh, element blank, um, for example, that uh, which draws nothing and suppress the appearance of elements we are not interested in, and element line, which draws uh, lines. And then we have the theme function, which allows you to override the default theme elements by calling the element function here. Great. So um, by executing uh, these, um, uh, these code chunk, what, you, what we obtain is this type of plot. If, if we zoom in it a little bit, um, we can see the name on the x-axis, we can see the name of the top five rated wines. Uh, and on the uh, y-axis, we can, we can see their average rating. And we can see that they all have the same average rating of about 99. Uh, great, so we, we already extracted a useful insight from our data, right? And the good thing when working with Tideverse is that when you start understanding how library works, uh, learning further functionalities become easier and easier. So let's dive deeper into ratings analysis by exploring the data distribution of those ratings. Um, how we can do that? So we can start from um, from computing uh, the, the common metrics to measure distribution, which are called the measures of central tendency, um, uh, which are the mean, which is a simple average computed over the total number of samples. Then we have the median, which is the value in the middle of the range of all the sample values. And then we have the mode, which is the most commonly occurring value in the, in the sample set. Um, so let's start by computing and printing these values together with the minimum and the maximum values also um, in a way to have a first overview of the data distribution. So here is the result. We have a minimum rating value of 85, a maximum rating, va rating values of 99, and a mean, a median, and mode values very close to each other, um, around 91. Um, so now, um, to go to go a step further, um, 
we can visualize this data distribution plotting. One way to do that is plotting an histogram. And in ggplot2, there's again a specific geom function to do it, uh, which is which this time, as intuitive as possible, is called geom histogram. And uh, this time, the IS parameter maps the feature we want to represent the distribution of, uh, while the bin width and the boundary parameters specify respectively the width of each bin and the distance between different bins. Now, to incorporate the numerical statistics previously computed in our graph, so the minimum, the maximum, the median, the mold, etc., we can rely on the geom v line function, uh, which adds a vertical reference line to a plot. Uh, also, we can add labels entitled to the chart and display the result. Um, so um, let, let's see. Let's have a look to the plot here. So this is the, um, the, the this is the resulting plot. We have the the rating on the x axis and we have the frequency on the on the y axis. Um, and um, here we have the minimum reference value, the maximum reference value, and the mean, the median, and the mode uh, in, the, in the middle. So we can observe that for the rating data, the mean, the median, and the mode all seem to be more or less in the middle uh, between the minimum and the maximum at around 90, 91. Also, we can notice in this chart the characteristic bell curve of what statisticians call a normal distribution with the mean and the mode at the center and symmetric tails. This is not really a surprise for us since all kinds of variables in natural and social science are normally or approximately normally distributed. So another way to visualize the distribution of a variable is to use a box plot. Uh, and again, we have a specific geom function for box plot, which is called a geom box plot. Um, let's have a look to the resulting box plot. Uh, so the box plot shows the distribution of the of the rating values in a different format than the histogram. Um, the box part of the plot shows where the inner two quartiles of the data reside. So in this case, half of the ratings are between approximately 90 and 92. Uh, while the whiskers extending from the box show the outer two quartiles, so the other half of the ratings in this case are between 87 and 90 or 92 or 95. And the line in the box indicates the median, the median value. So it's often useful to uh, plot both the histogram and the box plot because in some ways it can be helpful to think of the histogram as a front evil elevation view of the distribution and the box plot as a plan view of the distribution from above. Let's move now to the second question of our uh, exploratory analysis. So the second question was, what are the chocolates from Italy? So let's move our analysis to the chocolate table, and in particular, let's explore chocolate's company's location. Um, so Corey showed us how these type of questions can be answered by relying on the where statement. So again, we can use our db get query function to query the database with the SQL query um, and specify the SQL query itself here. But also for this data set, we can have more than one review for each chocolate item, as we saw for the wines. And that's why we're going to introduce uh, the distinct operator here, which allows us to extract a distinct combination of uh, the following listed columns. So we want to extract uh, a distinct combination of these columns from chocolate ratings, uh, but selecting only um, uh, the, the rows which respect these were closed, so the, where the company location is equal to Italy. Uh, and this is the result. Here we have all the list of um, um, all the list of the chocolate items um, whose company location is is Italy. Um, now this is this was quite straightforward uh, after Corey's explanation, right? So um, let's go let's let's go a step a, a step further. Um, we want to visualize the proportion of these chocolate products coming from Italian companies um, in relationship with all the other chocolate products. In other words, we want to relate this slice of data with the whole. 
And one common way to visualize proportions in data um, is using pie charts. But first of all, let's prepare our data for visualization. How we can prepare our data? We need, first of all, to count the number of distinct chocolate products for each company location. And that's why we use here again um, distinct to select a distinct combination of these columns. And we group by company location because this time we want to count um, uh, the number of chocolate I of distinct chocolate items for, for each company location. Um, and also, since we want to uh, visualize the proportions for each company location, but we have quite a lot of different locations in our data set, uh, let's compute the total sum of chocolate products for countries where the number of chocolate items is less than 35. And this is what we are actually doing here. Uh, why we are doing so? Because uh, this portion of the data set will be represented as a unique slice in the pie chart with the label others, while all the other countries which have a higher number of chocolate products, higher than 35, so they are, um, let's say, um, more represented in our data set, will be represented by a single slice in the pie chart. Um, so um, that's why we are doing all this computation here. In particular here, we are using the pool function that in R uh, is used to um, actually extract a column from a data set um, and converting it into a vector. And then we are applying a sum in order to have the total number of chocolate items per country for which we, well, let's say less represented, so for which we have less than 35 chocolate items per country. Um, so how now, how we can, um, uh, now again, we are going to, um, um, uh, so here we have our n chocolates per country data set with um, the the count for each the count of chocolate items for each company location. Here we are filtering um, the ones with a number of chocolate items greater than thirty five. So all the company all the, the all the company locations for which we have uh, a single slide in the pie chart. Let's say, um, and then here we are preparing. We are trans. We are yeah modifying our um, our data set in a way to have um, uh, two columns, the company location here and the number of chocolate items per per location in the right in the second column in the right side of, of this data set. And then we are also binding with this R bind, we are binding another column for the others group, uh, which are all the countries for which we have um, a less number of chocolate items per country, lower than 35. Um, so let's plot this now, let's visualize this. Uh, in ggplot2, a pie chart is a stacked bar chart whose plotting function is um, a geom bar, um, plus a polar coordinate, you see here, chord polar. So differently from geom call that we have used before um, for bar charts, Geom bar makes the height of the bar proportional to the number of cases in each group. Uh, and since we add a polar coordinate, the value of the height of the bars is translated in the angle of the slice in the pi. And in the chord polar function here, you can see that we have the y, uh, the y argument, which is which define the variable to map the angle too. Uh, and while the start parameter equal to zero here is the offset of starting point from 12 o'clock in radians. Um, so in this case, it's zero. So we are starting exactly from 12 o'clock. Uh, finally, geom text function, um, we use it for adding a label for each slice with the percentage of n chocolate products for each location. And this is the result. Let's have a quick look to, to the result. So the major, um, we can see here uh, that the major, uh, the country which has the major number or percentage of chocolate items is USA, while Italy, which was the, the slice we were um, uh, considering before, is only 3%. And we, ha and we have insights all of all the major, um, um, producers of, of chocolates uh, with, with these pie charts. 
Um, great. So now um, let's go to our last um, point of our da exploratory data analysis, which, if you remember, was um, analyzing pairings between uh, wines and chocolates with similar tastes. In fact, we learned so far how to visualize quantities, how to visualize data distribution and proportion. But now let's explore wines and chocolate pairings with similar taste. And in particular, let's select all the spicy chocolates and wines and let's join them based on the region. So to extract chocolates and wines categorized with spicy tastes, we can look for the word spicy in the open textual fields of the reviews, which are most memorable characteristics for, um, for wines and notes for chocolates. So as, as Corey uh, did before, we are using the like statement and the white cards operator here to, to spot this spicy word in this open textual field. Um, while to combine chocolates and wines by pairing them by location, we can rely on the um, on the join statement here, the inner join, and we are joining this case on the region. So we we are setting company location equal to region as um, as close of our join statement, and we are using the inner join here because we are selecting records that have matching values in both in both tables. So as last step of our exploratory analysis, we wish to test the following hypothesis and that the regions that have the highest ratings for spicy wines also have high ratings for spicy chocolate. And to check that, let's calculate the average rating for chocolate and wines uh, grouping by region. Uh, so here we are, um, as you can see, we are grouping by region. We are um, summarizing in a way to um, to count the average chocolate rating and the average wine rating. And then we are using this verb mutate, which in DPR is used to edit a column. And in this case, we are editing the region column in a way to rearrange the, the list of regions uh, with um, a, no, a descending order or average chocolate rating for visualization purposes. Uh, then we are rescaling both the average chocolate rating and the average wine rating in the same scale because they were on different scales. We are scaling now them on the same scale from 0 to 10 in a, in a way that they can be comparable. And finally, we pivot longer the data set in a way to make our data set longer by increasing the number of rows and decreasing the number of columns. This allows us to have, as, as a result, a, a, this kind of table, which is prepared for our, for our data visualization. So we have a column for region, we have a column for ratings type, which, which can be average chocolate or average wine rating, and then we have the values, which is a value in the in a scale of 0, 10. Um, now, to test our hypothesis, we can plot a bar chart um, and we can visualize those average ratings for each region um, with different color for chocolates and, and wine. Um, so this is the resulting um, plot. Let's zoom it and have a look. Uh, this is our bar chart. Uh, we can see that we have the average chocolate ratings in a descending order. So the first country for average chocolate rating is France, while the first country for average wine rating is this one, which is Hungary. So our hypothesis is not really true. Um, but anyway, we can find useful insights for, from this plot as well and compare average chocolate rating and average wine rating. So this, is, this was all for the demo today. Um, so uh, Corey, I will ask you to, to wrap up because I think we are uh, really close to the end of the session, unfortunately. Yep, I think we will actually um, lose our Twitch audience now as I think some, a .NET session is getting started. So sorry for the confusion. If you saw a uh, Python or a notebook being presented, Jupyter Notebook, but uh, yeah, that will be switched over. Uh, we did have some good questions that I, I want to, to address. So um, first sure. one uh, from Nugarojo uh, was asking what sort of specific tools that we would like uh, to use as far as analyzing data. 
And for me, um, I think it's really about uh, the focus on what tools you know. Um, most of the, the tools out there can do uh, similar things, whether that's you know uh, Excel or is if it's Python or R or BI tools. Um, but yeah, I mean, for my personal choice, it's Python. And I, I would assume, Carlota, uh, R is, is yours? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, as you said, um, I mean, it depends from what tools you are most familiar with. with. Uh, if you are a programmer, uh, probably the best choices are R and Python. Um, I really like this question as well uh, from Ramya. Uh, I should have made this clear as well. Uh, but, you know, we were trying to show, uh, you know, the different levels of queries uh, and, you know, how on a simpler way, how, how to work with them. Uh, but yes, the question is around how to make, you know, inserting uh, data simpler. And, you know, yes, it would be very tedious if you had a large amount of data to have to do, to do an insert statement every single time. Uh, so depending on the, you know, coding language that you have, maybe the data is stored in an array or a dictionary or something like that. And you could actually um, translate that into an insert statement much easier. Uh, so again, automation is possible. You don't really have to do one insert statement every single time. That would be uh, really tough. <laughs> uh, there was another question. Let me see. It was around inner joins and R. So I'll let you take that one, Carlota, if you can see it. Uh, so is the logic of the inner join and so on the same as in R? Um, yes, of course. So the inner join, both in SQL and R, has the same uh, as the same logic. So you take only the rows uh, which matches in both tables, uh, which was, for example, what we want, we wished for our um, for our project because we wish to pair the chocolate and wines with similar tastes and same region. So we have very strict um, um, constraints, let's say. Very nice. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, you know, the journey does not have to end here. Um, so we do have um, a relational database uh, session on our Microsoft Learn platform. You can see the URL there. And then as well, all of the resources that we showed you in the GitHub repo um, that Carlito had uh, showed you with the notebook in it uh, can be found here as well as additional resources around uh, actually deploying um, to uh, or connecting to, uh, let's say, an Azure database, um, as well as some of the data visualization stuff. So everyone have a great evening or a great day or wherever you're calling from. But uh, thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, everyone.